the honorable ministers and honorable members of Iyala. I always like to start the issues of Africa in 1900. Some Ugandan people say, Kamara Matsuko, Nkechum Yahanda. This translates as when a spear thrust by the enemy injures your internal organs, then you know that your hope for survival is very limited. Those Ugandans thought that it, it was all right to be speared in the arm, leg, but the intestines, that's why they call it Kamara Matsuko, the, the counselor of hope, the, the counselor of hope, Kamara Matsuko. In other words, injuring the internal organs of a person is a decisive blow, different from injuring the leg, arm, etc. I call 1900 Kamara Matsuko the extinguisher of hope, because by that year, the whole of Africa had been colonized except for Ethiopia. Wa Africa wote walikuwa wameshikwa na wakoloni. Ispokuwa Ethiopia. Why couldn't Africa defend itself? mainly because of internal weaknesses. We blame Europeans for colonizing us, but if you, if you find somebody disorganized, why not take advantage of him or her? I know that we are supposed to be Christians and Muslims and not take advantage of others. But Christianity remains in the Bible most of the time. It doesn't go into practice. Therefore, if you keep yourself weak, you do so at your own peril. Come on, Africa. I know Africans like conservation. conservation. We conserve mountain gorillas, we conserve wild animals. We conserve many things, but also to conserve weakness. is not a good idea. The Africans are favored by God and by nature. They live in a land area which is 11.7 million square miles of land in size, bigger than the United States, China, Brazil, and Western Europe combined. You can put China, you can put India, you, uh, India, you can put... Africa is bigger than all this. This land is very well watered by powerful rivers, the Nile, 
the Congo, the Zambezi, the Limpopo, the, the Nija, not to mention the smaller ones like the Kagera, the Rufiji, the Ruvuma, the Manu in West Africa, all these rivers are there. It contains vast lakes. such as Narubare, which is called Lake Victoria internationally, Ruchuru, Tumbi, Lake Edward, Masiolo, Lake George, Mwitanzige, Lake Albert, Kivu, Lake Kivu, Lake Tanganyika, Lake Nyasa, Lake Turkana, ETC. Africa has one billion people, are divided into just four linguistic groups. Th there is a, a story that Africans are so divided that they are Hawahusiani. There is that uh, uh, propaganda. But in fact, the Africans are divided into four linguistic groups. The Niger Congo, including the Bantu and the Kwa groups, the Nilo Saharan, including the Nilotic and the Nilo Hamitic dialects, the Afro Asiatic, Arabic and Amharic, and a few others, and the Khoisan, the, the, what are called Bushmen in South Africa. Yet, the reactionaries, I use this word reactionaries. For excited to know our pinga maendereo. Talk as if the African peoples are so divided that they cannot live together. This is what you hear. You hear in, even in the schools, even in universities, they teach you this rubbish. Somebody can get a degree in this rubbish. <laughs> you can get a degree in sectarianism. PhD. How to prove how this tribe is against the other one, how this one. No, put a PhD. Yet, moreover, even the four linguistic groups mentioned above are linked among themselves with one another. The Somalis, for instance, call a cow Sa. If you ask the Somalis, I, I normally use this to, 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 to check. So whenever I go, I say, what do you call cow? He tells me. And what do you call this? What do you call that? Now, for instance, the Somalis, they call cow sa. S -A, I think it is S -A, -A, a or something like that, the way they pronounce it. The Banyankore, those are some group in Uganda, you may not have heard of them. There's some group there. <laughs> Banyarwanda, Baganda, I think even Barundi, use that word sa for cow dung. Is that not what the Banyarwanda call Obusa? Huh? Obusa, huh? Is that what they call it Banyarwanda? Amasha. Huh? Amasa. Yes, the same. <laughs> now, but you can see how the Somalis, I don't know who distorted what. <laughs> Whether it was the Somalis who transferred the word sa to the cow or whether it was we who transferred the word sa to, to the cow dung instead of the whole cow. 
But you can see the linkage. You can see the linkage. It is all about the cow. Our neurotic people, they call water P. 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 I told P. Now, what do the Somalis call water? B O. Can you see? P B O. P. Very close. What are the African people there for? Are either similar or linked? The pre colonial chiefs preferred to keep them divided in small tribal kingdoms, chiefdoms, or segmented societies, and those divisions are still being promoted by the reactionaries today. This was definitely one of the causes for the colonization of Africa. Some people try to say that technology was the main cause for our colonization. I do not believe this. China and Japan were backward technologically at that very time. The Europeans tried to colonize them, but they failed. The Europeans invaded China. There's a time when they attacked China, I think it was in 1850-something, in what they called the Opium War, to force the Chinese to, to, to drink opium. Yes, so if you don't drink opium, we, we, we attack you. The Europeans tried to colonize China, but they failed. They tried to colonize uh, Japan, they failed. Why? And they were still backward technologically, they were not very advanced. Even Ethiopia could not be conquered by the Europeans. Why? They were not easy to swallow because of a higher degree of political integration. Anyway, I always say that the defeat of the whole of Africa by 1900 was the ultimate vote of no confidence in the pre-colonial feudal systems of Africa. Because if the feudal systems were good, why were they? Why, did they? why did they not defend us? Africa regained her freedom. Why? It was because of three factors. One, the resistance of the African peoples, two, the emergence of the socialist bloc of countries like the Soviet Union and China in 1917-1949 respectively, and three, the two inter-imperialist wars of 1914-1918 and 1939-1945 that weakened the imperialist countries to our advantage. These are the factors that caused us to get our freedom. First, our resistance. Second, the support of the socialist countries. And thirdly, fortunately, the imperialists were fighting among themselves, which was good for us, that First and Second World War. But even after, the, 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 uh, after their wars, after we were used to fight, you know, we were taken there. Even my father was almost taken, but his father bribed and uh, he stayed out. I think that's why, why I was born in 1944. I would have born, been born later. The, even after that, those wars, the imperialist countries tried to reestablish colonialism. You remember the war in Indochina? You know, after, after those wars, this people wanted to continue with, the, with colonialism. Mau Mau, you remember Mau Mau? I don't know why Africans forget so easily. It's really amazing.
We had also survived colonialism. And like, you know, when you are colonized, it's not a nice experience. Some of the people who are colonized could not survive. You remember the Red Indians? The Aztecs in Mexico? The Incas in Peru? Where are they? Wako wapi? Fortunately for the, European, for the Africans, they don't die easily. <laughs> so, we survived. We survived. Why did we survive? Because of our strong civilization that had evolved quite advanced agriculture. That is how we were able to survive the diseases brought by the Europeans and Arabs, such as smallpox, jiggers, etc. All those we survived. <laughs> our cattle, our sheep, our goats, our chicken ETC had inoculated us against those diseases that are, are called zoonotic diseases. Those diseases between, I can see a doctor there. That's, that's a doctor. Are you not the doctor? The, your brother is the doctor. There are these diseases which are called zoonotic, which go between human beings and, 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 and animals. So by keeping animals, because of our advanced agriculture. These cows we have, and, and goats and all that, we are vaccinating, yes. <laughs> so by the time the Europeans brought their diseases, we, we were able to survive. Therefore, the African peoples were and are, and, are, and are still quite advanced in civilization, in language, agriculture, technology, iron working, and social organization, but very weak in political organization. That's where the problem is. We are strong in all other things except political organization. confining themselves to tribal, clan, ETC level of organization, and therefore not taking full advantage of the similarities and the linkages of the African peoples. After independence, the, the political leaders have also confined themselves to the colonial states, Uganda ETC, as if these colonial states were made by God. Uganda is good by giving each of our families a bigger market to sell our products and improve our welfare instead of confining ourselves to the tribal uh, states. But if Uganda is good, why can't East Africa be better? If you say Uganda is good, 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 okay. If Uganda is good, why can't East Africa be better? Political organization was weak in the pre-colonial times. That is why we were colonized. And it is still weak even now. That is why we do not yet carry commensurate weight Africa deserves. Eventually, we regained our independence, with Ghana being the first in 1957. 
Unfortunately, on account of, again, exogenous from outside and endogenous from inside factors, 50 years after independence, most of the African countries are still listed as LDCs, least developed countries. Today, the middle income countries in Africa are 25. That means the majority are still the uh, LDCs. There is not a single first world country in the whole length and breadth of Africa. Why? In the last 50 years in which I have been active in the resistance struggles in Uganda and Africa, either directly or indirectly, I have been together with our colleagues able to study the situation. In these 50 years, I have identified 10 strategic bottlenecks which I would like to again mention here. I have mentioned this before and some, some other places, but there's no harm in repeating them here because Moses identified 10 commandments about 5,000 years ago. And up to today, whenever we go to church, we are reminded about those 10 commandments. So there's no harm in repeating something if it is useful. Now, these 10 strategic bottlenecks are the following. The first one has been ideological disorientation, whereby the reactionaries fragment the African peoples in sectarian, sectarianism of tribe, religion, and gender chauvinism, suppressing women. I don't know why they, they decided to suppress women, and yet women are the very big force in society. Two, this ideolo ideological disorientation cannot allow the reactionaries to build viable and capable state pillars such as army, civil service, judiciary, etc. Consequently, any slight disturbance or challenge leads to the collapse of the state authority to the detriment of the people. Killings, raping, defilement, looting, and all sorts of crime with impunity become the lot for the people. That's why you find some of these countries just collapse. There is some rebel group somewhere. The, the, the whole regime collapses. So, what sort of groups are these? Then they call United Nations. Calling United Nations is a vote of no confidence in your people. How can I call United Nations to come and solve my problems in Uganda? How? What am I for? Those 34, 35 million Ugandans producing so many children, each one of them. Why can, they, why can they not defend their country? Why? Because the reactionaries cannot organize society. If you believe in tribalism, if you believe in, in religious sectarianism, if you look down upon women, how? How would you organize? That's why they cannot organize. The reactionaries. Uganda has had so many problems. But we have never called for the United Nations. It's an insult for, to tell me that the United Nations come to Uganda to, to, to defend Uganda. It's an insult. It's an insult to, to us. You are the ones who invited me. I didn't want to say these things. So, <laughs> if you don't want me to say this, please don't invite me. Th then you will be, you will be comfortable.
strategic bottleneck number three, owing to, owing to inadequate analysis, attacks against the private sector, including the physical expansion of elements of the entrepreneurial class. In the case of Uganda, became very common in Africa. Yesterday, I was launching a, a, a new line for one of the factories in Uganda. And I was telling those people who are there, you hear those Ugandans speaking in our local language. Factory yomu yindi. Ekoro yomu yindi. Ekoro yomu zungu. A coral is, is a factory, the factory of the white man, the factory of the Indian. And I was telling those people in Uganda yesterday that there are no Indian factories in Uganda. All the factories in Uganda, whether they are operated by Indians or Arabs or whatever, they are Ugandan factories. The Indian factories are in India. People cannot understand, the, you know, so many people have been through school. They cannot understand the concept of GDP. That concept, GDP, what is GDP? Gross domestic product of all what is being produced in your country. That's yours. That's not the GDP of India or of, of, of Europe. But those wonderful people of mine there in Uganda, factory home in India. Because it is owned by an Indian, in Uganda they think it is an Indian's factory. No, that factory is a Ugandan factory. And we had even to go into the, into the arithmetic. I asked that, this was a Coca-Cola factory yesterday, I was, they were putting a new line there. So I asked the owners, I said, what is the gross turnover here per annum? He said $100 million. That's what that factory is earning now. So I said, okay. This is the gross earning of this factory. But by the time he pays the workers their salaries, he, uh, I, I, I said, uh, where does he get money to pay you? They said, yeah, he, he, gets it, he gets it from the 100 million. Now, how about uh, the, the people who own that Coca-Cola plant are uh, South Africans, South African whites. So I was asking our people, I said, are these whites coming with their own electricity? They said, no. Wh whose electricity are they, are, are they buying? Said, Ours. Are they coming with their own water? Said, no. Whose water are they buying? Ours. So by the end of, the, of, of doing all that, you will find that out of the $100 million which they are earning, 85% belongs to those, those, those Africans there in Uganda. Yet they call this factory home zoom, factory home yind. So this ignorance is very, very dangerous. It has been part of the problem. That's why a character like Idi Amin could wake up, expel all the Asians, and he was being applauded by the the Africans, they thought this was a good thing. So this was part of the problem. The private sector should be encouraged. Even when there's no direct attack on the private sector, corruption, bribery, extortion, 
and poor administration of, or, or regulation also hamper the thriving of the private sector. Fundraising is by politicians and other groups, e.g. churches, mosques, can also disrupt the growth of the private sector and the accumulation of capital. I am thinking of banning fundraising in Uganda. Because, you know, they just, they call, they say, this is fundraising. So they, they call people, you, you come. The peasants come and sit there, a big number. When it comes fundraising, the, the peasants just keep quiet. The only ones who are doing fundraising are the politicians and a few business people. Now, this is an indirect tax on the, on the business. And it is impoverishing the, the politicians. The politicians get into debt. Eh? Here in Rwanda, they do it in a better way. They call it Omuganda. Omuganda is better because you go with your labor. There's no money involved. But this tax is, is not a good idea. It interferes with the, with the building of capital, capital accumulation. A poor culture of saving on account of ostentatious consumption Drunkenness and other forms of social indiscipline also interfere with the capital accumulation and therefore the strengthening of the private sector. So this is uh, obstacle number three. Number four, an, an, an underdeveloped human resource on account of lack of education and lack of health care. A non-literate, non-skilled population does not fully realize its potential. Five, inadequate infrastructure that causes the cost of doing business in our countries to go up, thereby undermining the profitability of companies operating in our countries. Six, small internal markets on account of the excessive balkanization of Africa that cannot support large-scale agricultural and industrial production. There was also neglect of development of developing export-oriented industries apart from exporting and processed minerals and other raw materials. Number seven, lack of industrialization whereby we export and process agricultural products and, and minerals thereby losing money and jobs to the outsiders. Number eight, an underdeveloped services sector. Number nine, an underdeveloped agricultural sector. And number 10, lack of democracy. The African countries, after a number of wasted decades, have started solving some of these strategic bottlenecks. Democracy is now more widespread than in the 1960s and 1970s, for instance. Private sector aid growth is now accepted. Market integration started after the 1980 Lagos Action Plan. In the case of the East African community, it had started in 1948 with the East African High Commission and later on the Common Services Organization, but broke down during Amin's time. We revived it in 1993. This is a good start in re resolving this debilitating factor that undermines the profitability of businesses on account of the narrow markets that were caused by the balkanization of Africa. Without a big market, private business cannot develop. There is no way private business can thrive if we do not solve the, the problem of market. 
I will give you an example. When Idi Amin came to power, the economy of Uganda collapsed. And Uganda, like from 1972, Uganda more or less became part of Kenya in terms of supply of goods. All industrial products were coming from Kenya. But Kenya is not yet a first world country. We are still together with Kenya. In spite of monopolizing the, the market of Kenya and the market of Uganda during the, the, the time when the Ukrainian economy had collapsed, still Kenya is still, uh, are they classified as a, mid, a medium income country or, or, or something? M middle income country now. What is the GDP per capita? About 1,000 or something? I'll have to get the figures. But they are not very far from us. So that's why when I, I, I hear, uh, Kenya is uh, what? I said, please, don't waste my time comparing pygmies. Which pygmy is slightly taller than the other one? <laughs> so in spite of Kenya monopolizing the market of Uganda in addition to the market of, of, of Kenya for a very long time, Still, Kenya is still, we are still in the same league. So which means that in order for countries to develop, you really need a big, 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 big market. Not just a small, small. Uh, and that's how the Asian countries like South Korea, because for them they went for export-oriented growth. South Korea did not only export to Thailand, they export globally. They were able to get uh, access to the big, bigger international market. But in order to get the big international markets, you need to have your own market. Because you need to bargain with the others. You need to bargain with them. They are not going to give you just for free. So if you are very small, how would you bargain, even for the international, the big international markets? On today's occasion, I would like to talk on just two of the 10 strategic bottlenecks which I've mentioned above. One, I would like to talk on the issue of small markets, and secondly, talk on the issue of inadequate development of infrastructure, especially electricity. The disorientation I mentioned above did not only apply to ideology, it also, it also applied to even the concepts of development. The amount of opposition we have faced on the issue of increasing electricity generation is unbelievable and shameful. I have been in that government for quite a bit of time. You, 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 you know that you must have heard that I've been there for a bit. Some. <laughs> now, in many of these years, I was fighting those people, the civil servants, fighting the civil servants. They have no idea about the importance of electricity. When they see one bulb shining in Kampala, they think there's enough electricity. It's unbelievable. You can't believe it. And this is not only a disease in Uganda, it is in the whole of Africa. Because I've been to all these countries. Let me, however, start with the issue of small markets. I've already said that at least the African leaders, after 1980, started working on the issue of the regional trading blocks. 
That is how we got COMESA, the Central African Association, that one of Congo and those places, and ECOWAS. ESC was already there, as already pointed out above, only that it broke down in 1977 until we revived it in 1993. SADC, started off as the frontline states and the liberation movements that had been fighting colonialism in Southern Africa in the 1960s, 70s, and part of the 1980s until the emancipation of South Africa in 1994. Of all these blocks, the East African community is the one with the brightest future and with the greatest hope for Africa. East African community does not just aim at economic integration. It also aims at political integration through the formation of the East African Federation. That is what Article 5.2 of the East African community says. At some stage, we proposed to fast track this political integration. All the people of East Africa supported this, and it was only in a few cases where there were some concerns about certain issues. This was very encouraging and laudable. The case for the political federation is, is on account of the following points. First, even if the economic integration is successful, there are very crucial issues that you cannot address just by economic integration. It is not easy, for instance, to address the issue of common defense when you are different countries. Yes, you can have collective defense, such as in the case of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaties Organization. However, those defense pacts normally depend on one or so strong members, such as, such as the United States of America, in the case of NATO. Where is the USA of Africa? Do we have a USA here who can be our anchor? In NATO, you have those small countries, Denmark, I don't know whether Iceland is one of them, this uh, looks back, I don't know whether they are members. You have got a lot of those small countries in, in Europe, but their anchor is the United States of America. So who is the anchor for Africa? Or we don't, or, or, or we don't need an anchor. We are a ship without an anchor. Very dangerous enterprise in the ocean. A politically united East Africa would provide the beginning of the U.S. of Africa, which could provide the center of gravity of Africa's future. How have we ensured Africa against future recolonization and marginalization since independence? When Africa confronted the moribund Portuguese colonialists, and the racists in Southern Africa who were supported with weapons by the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China. That is how we won military victories in Mozambique, Samora Masher and Frerimo, in Zimbabwe, Zanu Zapu, in Angola, MPLA, in Namibia, Swapo, and in South Africa, ANC. The socialist camps became part of the strategic rear of Africa with a clout that was respected and feared globally. What is our feared or respected strategic rear now? Because we won the war against the Portuguese in Mozambique, in Angola, 
in uh, Rhodesia, in Namibia, in South Africa, but who were supported by the socialist camp. Very powerful bloc, very powerful. Will they be there all the time for us? You think the Chinese don't have the other business to do? Just there to support weak Africans? All the time? In 1960, they supported Africa, weak Africans. In 1970, they supported weak Africans. In 1980, don't the Chinese have their own agenda? They have no other work other than supporting Bakate Yamba, the ones who cannot help themselves. This is a very big mistake. It is our duty to create this strategic rear when conditions are still favorable. It is inexcusable that we have squandered the last 50 years without doing this. Some global actors are trying to achieve military superiority on land, in the air, at sea, and in space. Where does this leave Africa? Somebody is trying to achieve superiority on land, military superiority, in the air, on the sea, in space, and for us, we're just here. The second, th th second point for case for political integration Fragmenting the, fragmenting the hinterland from the sea coast is another big disadvantage created by the present balkanization and is fraught with potential problems. Like the other time when we had the problems in Kenya, when those people were rioting and so on, who were here, just with we, we, we the hinterland countries, who were just here watching. No fuel, no whatever is coming from outside. We're watching. We can't come in. We can't come in to say, please, what's the problem? Because that's an independent state. We could even have helped uh, those people to stop that rioting. Because at that time, there was no rioting here, at least. But we couldn't do it because it is. When one million people were killed here, who were there? We could, have, we could have come in and helped, but we couldn't because this is, Rwanda is an independent state. And when you are independent, you have got a right to kill the people. You, you, you. We couldn't. And if we had tried to, it would have created more confusion. Because those who want to maintain confusion in Africa would have said we are interfering in the internal affairs of, of a sovereign country. That would have been another problem. So we sat here waiting for the dead bodies to flow in the Kagera to, to, to come to, to Uganda. 40,000 bodies which we buried at, uh, near Lake Victoria. So this political fragmentation disables us from common action. Fragmenting the natural resources is another weakness. The African community has always had tremendous natural resources. New ones are being discovered. If these were under one political roof, our bargaining power in the world would be much greater. When we negotiate separately, there are even attempts at playing us against each other. You hear words like, if you do not agree to these terms, your neighbors will leave you behind. Because we found some little oil somewhere. 
That oil has also become a problem. We found this oil in 2006. Up to now, we have not pumped one gallon out of the ground because we have been paralyzed with the oil companies. The oil companies first refused to pay tax. We said, you should pay, pay tax. If you don't pay, you go away. The, eventually, they have now paid. Now we are on other issues. But the, 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 unfortunately, we are beginning to find some uh, oil and gas in other parts of East Africa. In Kenya, we found some, they found some oil there. In uh, Tanzania, gas. But I, I think even oil is, is there. Because some of the geography is the same. In Burundi, our people have told uh, the Burundi that we think you have some oil there because your geology is the same as ours there. Uh, in Rwanda, they, they, they have got uh, methane gas in Lake Chivu. Now, if we negotiated together for these resources, it would be much better. Uh -huh. But now what they come, they come and, and, and they come and tell me, if you don't agree, the others will leave you. I say, I say if they leave behind, I will stay behind. I have no problem. Uh -huh. they, they, they have told me that. Yeah. That when I hear that, I show, oh, please, you take all the oil. No, no, no. Uh -huh. Number four, even economic integration per se is not easy when you are under separate political roofs. You have seen the problems in Europe recently. You have seen the problems in Europe. They, they are in real serious problems, how to manage that. Germany is saying this, Greece is saying that, Spain is saying that. Huh? Owing to different levels of development, mere economic integration may, may benefit different countries unequally. By being part of a common market, the consumers buy on equal terms a product produced anywhere in East Africa. Quota free, tax free. At our present level of integration, we do not, however, share the taxes from the factory or share the jobs. You see, when a factory is in Mombasa, what they produce, the people in Uganda buy. So the Ugandans support the Kenyan factory by buying what it produces. But if my daughter goes to Mombasa to get a job there, they say, ah, where in Uganda? You are a Uganda, you want to get a job here. But I'm supporting it by, by buying from, from, that, that, from that factory. My purchasing power is supporting that factory. Now, when the Kenyans collect taxes on that factory, excise duty and so on. I don't share in that factory, in that tax. So that one is, has got potential for problems. You will get a situation where some of the countries uh, benefit more from the, uh, the common market than others. So how do you solve that? It has got some potential problems. In the end, it can create resentment uh, and, and, and even trouble. Within Uganda, there also there is also unbalanced development. Some parts of Uganda are developed; others are not. People in Karamoja have been running around for 
until recently when, when, they, when we have tried to make them settle down. But the difference is that when the factory is in Kampara, that Karamojong, when he's not raiding cows, he can bring his, his son to Kampara and he competes for a job. Nobody would discriminate him. Nobody would say, where is Karamojong ruling your No. He can compete for a job with others. He may get it, he may not get it. And in any case, the taxes which are collected, the Karamojong also have their share. After they have raided, they come back and say, oh, this is your share. Thank you very much for raiding. This is part of your money for your, for your district. So economic integration without political integration has got potential problems. This potential disenchantment, within, this has potential for disenchant, disenchantment with integration. When we had a retreat with President Chibaki and President Mukapa in August 2004 in Nairobi, we elaborated all the other reasons, and they are in the document we, we issued at the end of that meeting. Yala and all the East Africans should, pu should push even more for the cause of the East African Federation. The issue of infrastructure, especially electricity, shows how Africa got off the track even after independence. As I, I repeatedly tell whatever African audiences I get chances to uh, address, there is a kilowatt hour per capita yardstick that is simply amazing. The USA has a kilowatt hour per capita of 12,400. That is how you measure the electricity divided by the population. Some of the African countries have as low as 12. Uganda had a kilowatt hour per capita of 30 in 1986. We now have a kilowatt hour of 150. When Karuma, Ayago, Isimba, the main hydro stations that are about to be embarked on, and the geothermal project of Le Katwa are finished, we shall have a kilowatt hour per capita of 400. This is like in about five years' time. There is some awakening now in Uganda after repeated quarrels with the persons concerned. As of now, only South Africa and Libya have a kilowatt hour per capita of 4,000 and above. Uganda aims at 42,000 megawatts by 2040. Africa and the East African community needs a general awakening on this issue. We should not be diverted again. The other day I was having a, a discussion with one of our staff. They had delayed a power project for Lake, for Lake Katwe, geothermal. We think there are, there are 300 megawatts there. And this American, uh, American company had been coming, going, coming, going until I came to know of it and I, I, I called these people. There, there was this man who is in charge of the regulatory authority, there's some groups which we created there. What's your name, Mr. Mr. My name is so-and-so. Are you a, a, an educated person? Yes, I've got masters. I got a Bachelor of Engineering in the Soviet Union. I went and I got a Master's in the UK. 
in electrical engineering. Really? When you are studying in, in, the, in, in the Soviet Union, how much electricity was the Soviet Union generating? Said, uh, I, I don't remember what it was in the Soviet Union at that time, but now Russia is generating half a million megawatts. Mm -hmm. And when you are in UK, how much? How much is the UK generating? It says UK is generating 70,000 megawatts. So my question to him was that if you have been to all these places, you are an educated person, you are an electrical engineer, why do you think your own Uganda does not need electricity? He could not answer. Now, in that Ministry of Energy, there is a commissioner a commissioner. So you, what are you a commission of? Of electricity or darkness? <laughs> you can't believe what the problem in, in Africa is. You can't believe it. Of course, in the case of Uganda, we can have excuses that we had, uh, you know, I mean, and all that. But this, this is not true of the, of the rest of the continent. Even Idi Amin, if somebody had gone to him and said, Your Excellency, to be a, a, a big president, you need more electricity. I am sure Amin would have, would have supported it. So, please, this... And these people travel, they go all over the world, they see what's happening. In conclusion, I'm glad that most of the strategic bottlenecks have been identified and are being addressed. Uganda will become a lower middle income country by 2017 and, uh, and an upper middle income country by 2032 or earlier. At last, after endless internal struggles, this vision with the correct understanding of the, of, the, of the strategic bottlenecks has been incorporated into the five years and 10 years plans by the National Planning Authority. We are now moving, having wandered in the wilderness of ideological and conceptual confusion for some time. You remember the children of Israel when they spent 40 years in the desert? They didn't know how to, how to get to Canaan. That has been our story in, in, in Uganda, at least. By identifying some of these bottlenecks, much of Africa is beginning to move. The average rate of growth has doubled by, to 5.44% per annum since the year 2000, compared to a growth rate of 2.5% in the 1990s. When ESC gets closer together, the sky is the limit, especially now when we have discovered the gaps that crippled us in the past. There are, of course, other tactical bottlenecks, such as corruption, administrative delays, ETC, and also the some of the bottlenecks which the right honorable speaker mentioned, non-tariff barriers. Non-tariff barriers, policemen at roadblocks, um, endless way bridges, and so on. Uh, in this year of my chairmanship, 
I've been pushing the issue of infrastructure most. I visited Russia on a bilateral mission, but when I go there, I spoke with the President Putin and uh, put forward some of the pro projects to him. Uh, and when I came, I informed the Secretary General uh, to see how we follow up trying to uh, interest Russian groups into our infrastructure needs. Then we had the BRICS meeting in South Africa. Uh, and I, we had also a bilateral meeting with the President of China, Mr. Xi Jinping. Again, I put forward these uh, projects, especially the railway projects. From uh, East Africa, first of all, within East Africa, each of the different countries, then from East Africa to Congo, from East Africa to South Sudan, from East Africa to Ethiopia. Within uh, Uganda, we, we, are, we, are, we, we are training our army to build that railway, the one inside Uganda, to, to, to build it and uh, modernize it in partnership with the, whichever friend we may get. So the emphasis, whenever I get a chance, is to talk about the railway, the railway and, and also electricity. The idea of uh, a Chigari retreat is a very good one, a similar one. Uh, we, we, we shall organize it. I, I will talk with the Secretary General so that we, we, we call these organs and then we, we see how, what to, uh, how to share experiences. The legislative agenda uh, is also an important one. The speaker was saying that it's better to use legislation rather than protocols. Uh, she will coach me more on that. Now, on the amendments of the treaty, uh, we shall have, uh, I'll have to be guided what we need to put forward to the authority. Once we have dealt with the strategic bottlenecks, uh, like for instance, uh, you see once, uh, I don't know why people mix up things. Mao Zedong once said that if you get an egg which is not fertilized, the egg over hand, they are, they, are, they are hands of eggs which are not fertilized. They are called uh, agome yaga in Rinyankore. Amasumba. Wageta amasumba Muruganda. Amajama sumba. Kwa kiswari tunasemaji. Yare maya ya mbae hayako na mbegu ndani. Visa. Maya hii visa. Uh -huh. Now, Mao Zedong said, if you get my visa and you put them in the incubator, however long you put them there, they will not, you will not get sick. <laughs> so, if the plan is wrong from the core, there's nothing you can do. Therefore, if you do not deal with this strategy, like, like for instance, recently, we, last year, we commissioned 
a new power station after a long struggle. Uh, known as Ujagari with 260 megawatts. It helped. And the estimation was that we shall not have load shedding for the next two years. But now that the electricity is available, new factories have, have come, have, 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 have sprung up. The ones which were on, uh, on diesel have shifted to, to, to hydro. We are now threatening to have a shortage in a very short time. So if you deal with the basics, it is, it is easier to deal with the other little things they, they keep talking about, you know, efficiency and all of that, you know. And uh, I saw this in Mozambique. You, you remember, those of you who are old enough would remember that Mozambique was under war for a long time. But before the Portuguese left, they had built a big dam called Caborabasa. And it was there, not being used for a long time. But as soon as peace came, that Caborabasa was part of the recovery of Mozambique. Very quickly, a lot of companies rushed in, including big ones like uh, the one of aluminium. It came in because of the electricity. So while you may talk about uh, this and that and that, you can, even if you are efficient, you cannot be efficient without electricity. It is just an aberration. So let's deal with the basics it would then be easier to deal with the, uh, the, the, the tactical issues. Long live the East African community. Long live Iyala. Mungu ibariki Afrika. <laughs>